So um, last time we were talking about this uh, space, well, I called it y0 n last time, but I'm going to switch notations, write this for the stack. So this is the stack over z join 1 over n, which assigned to a scheme S, the groupoid of pairs, eg, where e over S is an elliptic curve, and uh, G is a gamma zero n structure on E. So it's a closed subgroup, which is finite and flat over S, and uh, cyclic of order n in each fiber. So this is the, the functor of points. It sends a scheme S to this groupoid. Uh, and so last time I called that Y0N, but I'm going to change notations and use this for the stack from now on uh, Y0N for the core space, which I'm about to introduce. OK, so uh, so last time we showed that this was a Deline mumford stack. And remember what that meant was that it had an Natal cover by a scheme. And the way that we found that scheme was, I mean, it was very explicit, right? You just looked at gamma p structure for p some different prime. So explicitly, if p doesn't divide n, you can let, let's say, y be the, uh, I mean, you define uh, a moduli problem, y, its functor of points, sends s to the set of isomorphism classes, b, g, uh, t, q, where this thing here is an elliptic curve. This is a gamma zero p structure, uh, sorry, gamma zero n structure. And this is a gamma p structure. They're the basis for the p torsion. And since, I mean, if p is bigger than 2, then gamma, zero, gamma, gamma p structures are rigid, right? There were no automorphisms. And so that means that this thing is actually going to be a scheme. So y is a scheme. And we have uh, a map from y to m0n, which is to forget the gamma p structure. And this is our a tau cover. Well, at least if p is inverted. There's a scheme over z joining over pn. So you have to use some different, you know, various primes p to get something that works over the full z join 1 over n. <laughs> and so actually, m0n is the quotient of y by the GL2 z mod p action, right? It's the quotient set. If you remember, this is how we even constructed the schemes y of n last time for certain n's using you know, y of 3 and added structure and then took quotients. You could also just take the scheme quotient instead of the stack quotient. This actually, uh, oh, 
oh, so sorry, again, this is just over z join 1 over pm. You have to invert this p that you're using for y. It's auxiliary structure. Okay, so this thing is the quotient scheme, and you can show that this represents the functor. which sends the scheme S to the set. Well, OK, I'll say something wrong first and then fix it. So you could consider the functor that sends the scheme S to the set of isomorphism classes in M0, N of S. Right, so this thing here, M0, N of S, is a groupoid. It's a category. And so we can take its set of isomorphism classes and actually get a set. And you can consider the functor that attaches to S this set. So actually, we talked about last time, this thing's not a sheaf, right? That's why you have to, we have to go to stacks. This thing's not actually representable. So this, this quotient can't represent this functor because that functor is not a sheaf. But it represents the sheafification. only works over z joint over pn. Okay, so using different p's, you can get rid of that p and get that this thing is represented over z joint 1 over n by a scheme. So, for the sheafification, Thing. is represented by a scheme which I'm going to call M0N, not a fancy typeface, or Y0N. These are going to be synonyms. Uh, and this works over Z join 1 over N. And in fact, this scheme is smooth and affine. And this is called the coarse space of the stack. Yeah. I believe so. I don't know the full, most fully general theorem, but I believe that in great generality they have coarse spaces. So okay, the core space is nice because it's a scheme instead of a stack. So it's a more concrete object. Uh, they have the same points over an algebraic closed field. I mean, the set of isomorphism classes in this thing over an algebraic closed field is the set of points of the core space. Uh, but the problem with the core space is that there's not a universal family over it, which is why we want to use stacks in the first place. All right, so I wanted to kind of introduce this now so that, I mean, if you're not very comfortable with stacks, you can kind of just think about these schemes, and you probably don't lose all that much if you just kind of pretend that everything works. So these things are pretty close to schemes. Uh, and we'll actually need these a little later on in, in future lectures. You know, I mean, we want to show that this functor is representable. I'm, showing, I'm saying that if you invert P, then this quotient represents it. And so if you use two different P's, you can get it represented over a cover of Z join 1 over N. Patch them together and get it over Z join 1 over N. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this doesn't depend on any choice, right? This is a canonical thing. So we have this canonical sheaf over Z join 1 over N, and then the proof of representability is, yeah. Yes? Well, no, I mean, I'm saying if you have any stack, you can consider this functor, right? Take the isomorphism and then sheafify it. And I'm just saying that the core space is the scheme that represents oh, that if it exists. Okay. And then I was saying that on closed points, they, I mean, on points over an algebraic closed field, they agree. 
That, that's like, you know, how, that, that's kind of a generalization of the statement that the J invariant determines the elliptic curve of an algebraic loop closed loop. Oh yeah, so I guess I should say the main example of this to keep in mind is that when n equals one, uh, this core space is the J line. So M zero of one, which is the same thing as what you call M of one, just no level structure, is A one, the J line. But this script thing is actually a stack. It's more complicated. Its fundamental group is like the profinite completion of SL2Z, so it's very interesting. All right, any questions about this? All right, so, the, the, okay. Uh, today I'm also going to talk about uh, compactifying these moduli problems in a moduli theoretic way uh, and extending them over Z. So those are the, the two other topics I want to talk about today. So first we'll do compactification. So we'll start in the level one case. Okay, so recall first of all what happened over C when we were doing things analytically. So we defined Y of one in that setting as the upper half plane mod gamma one. And that agrees with this thing, it's the J line. And so this is missing a point. And a nice way to add that point in was this construction where we did the upper half plane star, H star mod gamma one. H star was the union of H in the projective Q points of the projective line. And gamma 1 acts transitively on P1 Q. So, so you're really only adding one point. So P1 Q line gamma 1 is one point. And that's called the cusp. All right, so we want a, a moduli theoretic interpretation of what this means. So recall the, this valuative value of two criterion for properness. So if you have some scheme that you want to test if it's proper, so let's say you have some x over c, and uh, we should assume it's finite presentation, then finite presentation is proper if, so the idea is that you can fill in uh, point DVR points, right? So if A is a DVR, and K is its fraction field, then every K point of X extends uniquely to an A point. Finite presentation. Finite presentation. Okay, so this is sort of suggesting that compact, you know, the moduli interpretation of this additional point should somehow be related to how we fill in elliptic curves over DVRs. something that we talked about and we understand very well, right? So in particular, we have the semi-stable reduction here. So let's recall that. So this says that if you have an elliptic curve over some fraction field of a DVR, so A is a DVR, K is its fraction field, and 
is a multiplicative curve over k, then there exists some finite extension, k prime over k, and we have such that uh, e extends to something with semi-stable reduction over what you'd call a prime. And semi-stable reduction means either good reduction or multiplicative. All right, so if we're thinking about this moduli space of elliptic curves, I mean, if it extends to, you know, if it has good reduction, then it's extending to an elliptic curve over all of A. And you're not in this situation where you need to add anything to the moduli space. It's actually extending to an A point of the moduli space. But in this, in this case, where it extends to something with multiplicative reduction, right, that's not actually in the moduli space we have so far. So this is suggesting that this case is what we need to add, the missing point, the nodal cubic, right? So that's saying that what the moduli interpretation of the cusp should, the cusp should be the nodal cubic. So let me make some definitions uh, and then say a theorem which kind of says that this is the case. All right, so uh, let's take an integer n. So then I'm going to define something called the standard n gon. So the standard n gon. Which I'll call Cn. Uh, is just the quotient of p1 times z mod nz, where you identify infinity in the ith copy with zero in the i plus first copy. Yeah. That's kind of a, a subtle point. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Okay, so, uh, I mean, the picture for this is, right, you're taking P1, it's like the Riemann sphere, and you're just kind of gluing them together at points like this. Uh, or if you think of P1 as a line instead, you draw it like this. Yeah, yeah. This is a nodal curve, and so that's why it's called an n-gon. If you draw it like this, then you're actually getting a polygon. And the smooth locus of this guy is just the place where you, I mean, remove these points where there's nodes. So the smooth locus is just gm times z mod nz. And so this is a group. And furthermore, so I mean the group, it acts on itself by multiplication. And that action extends to an action on the full thing. So in this action, the GM part is just fixing these singular points, and the Z mod N Z part is just kind of spinning them around. Yeah, yeah. So C1 is the nodal cubic. Yeah, or P1 with these two points identified is just a nodal curve. And these bigger ones are just not reducible, not irreducible curves. All 
Okay, and so I, I, I want to point out now that uh, if we think of this thing as a group, Cn, that its n torsion has order n squared. And in fact, it fits into a short exact sequence like this. Right, so this mu n here is the torsion in gm, and then the quotient is this, z mod nz. So this mu n is in the identity component of this move like this. So another definition, um, a generalized elliptic curve. So the definition is that a generalized elliptic curve is basically an elliptic curve or one of these things. Okay, but we want to make the definition over arbitrary bases. So let me write it. So uh, over S is a tuple consisting of E, some operation called plus, and a section zero, so where uh, E is a proper flat family. Zero is a section, and plus is a, a map from the smooth locus of E times E to E such that two conditions hold. So first is that uh, this plush should turn the smooth locus into a group and define an action of the smooth part on the full thing. Second condition is that the geometric fibers should be elliptic curves or these end guns. Okay, so here's a moduli problem. So I'm going to define M1 bar. So I'm going to tell you its functor of points. So to a scheme S, it attaches the generalized elliptic curves over S, such that the fibers are either elliptic curves or one cons. So if you think of the C points of this, right, there's a unique one con over the complex numbers, just the one con. And so the C points of this are just the elliptic curves plus this one additional point. So we've just added one additional point to the usual, usual moduli space, which is how we wanted to compactify it. And so a theorem is that this thing is a, so this M1 bar is a proper smooth Lee mumford stack. The integers. So the key new thing here is proper. And let me make a remark about properness. So I wrote down previously the evaluative criterion for properness for schemes. For DM stacks, it's different. So you, you allow yourself to make a finite extension of the DVR before you have to fill in the point. That's in the definition of properness. Uh, otherwise, things like this wouldn't work correctly. So, uh, evaluative criterion for properness. DM stacks. Oh, 
allows a finite extension of DDRs. And so you see, if I have some elliptic curve over some DVR, so if A is a, oh, sorry, over the fraction field, so if A is a DVR, K is the fraction field, and E is some elliptic curve, right, the semi-stable reduction theorem says that I can go up to some finite extension and then fill it in so that it's either good or multiplicative reduction. Uh, and I mean, if you remember that if you use the minimal, I mean, the minimal regular model, uh, sorry, the minimal virus cross model, right, when you have multiplicative reduction, the special fiber is a node. So if you go up to semi-stable reduction to where you're semi-stable and use the minimal virus cross model, then that will fill this in over the DVR upstairs where the special fibers and elliptic curve are one guy. So then we get an A prime point of M bar one. So that's basically why it's proper. The semi-stable reduction theorem is basically equivalent to the properness of this thing. Yeah. To be smooth? No, but I mean it means that you have an Atal covered by a smooth thing. Because right, if you have a scheme, it's smooth if and only if it has an Atal covered by a smooth thing. Okay. And so you just make that definition for stacks. Yeah, there's also an infinitesimal criterion. Yeah. And so that would say that you can like, you know, lift things and, you know, curves, the obstruction theory, there's, it's unobstructed because there's no H2 for a curve. And yeah. So that's, you could also prove it that way, the smoothness. Any other questions? I think that's usually how it's done. But I think there are places where it becomes subtle. But uh, my understanding of it's not very good. Like, I think that defining like properness for R and stacks is more subtle. But I don't understand that stuff very well. All right, so this is compactifying just the problem of elliptic curves. So we want to also do it when we have level structure. Gamma zero n structure is what we care about most. All right, so if we have a generalized elliptic curve, uh, we can define what we mean by gamma zero n structure in the same way. structure should just be a cyclic order and subgroup inside of here. That, that's what I'll mean by a gamma zero n structure. And so the, the definition of uh, this m zero n bar, the compactified version, I mean it clearly should involve gamma zero n structures on generalized elliptic curves, right? There's a little bit of subtlety in the definition. So let me explain it. So, uh, okay, so to explain this, uh, I didn't actually ever talk about what the cusps of X0n look like, so let's first do that. So for the moment, let's suppose that n is prime, just to make life easier. We want to understand the cusps of X0n, just over the complex numbers, say. So the cusps of X0n h star mod gamma zero n r well I mean you take p one q and you quotient by gamma zero n right that's what the set of cusps is just by definition and it's not hard to show I mean this is just some set and this set is isomorphic to p one over f n mod the Borel inside GL2FN. Right, so there's a, a reduction that, right? If you have something in P1Q, you can clear denominators and make it in P1Z. 
and then you can reduce to Fn. And of course, gamma 0n is defined as the set of matrices that reduce them to g mod n. So you get a well-defined map here, and you can show that it's an isomorphism. And now here we just have the Borel acting on P1 Fn. So I mean, the way the Borel acts is by you know, sending x to Ax plus b. It's just linear maps. So it acts transitively on A1, and it fixes the point at infinity. So it has two orbits. This is a two-point set, which means there's two cusps. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we defined what the set of maps were right? is things that have one guns. So yes, I mean, if you're semi-stable, then you can build such a family. Yeah. Yeah, right. Ray White, I mean, I, I don't know what you would, how you would define what the right definition would be for that. Right, I mean, wh what kind of families would you want to consider? So you'd want curves where the fibers are what, like GMs or GAs? I just don't think there's like a good candidate for what you could want. I mean, the problem is that, I mean, if you think about what's going on over C, like, excuse me? Well, I mean, you want to constrain the genus of the fibers, right? But what do you mean generic fiber? I mean, you need to say what the C points are. And no, but I mean, to define the moduli problem, you just have to say what it is over any base. And so, for instance, what are the C points going to be? I mean, you have to just add one point to the set, the normal set of elliptic curves, right? So what curve are you going to add over C? Do you want to use the nodal cubic, or do you want to use GA, or do you want to use another curve? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that's just the problem. Like, the, the only... Possibly, you know, definition that works is the one that we have. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's related to the... Yeah, I mean, it's just because, I mean, when you go up, what the special fiber is can change. So, I mean, you have to kind of use what the stable one is to make things work out in the right way. Construct them over every possible base. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we said that there are two cusps. So x0n has two cusps. And this is for n prime. And maybe greater than two, I don't remember. Uh, and they're called zero and infinity. Uh, because they're the image of zero and infinity from qp1. So that tells us that we need to add two points to y0n to get the right thing. So in particular, it's not going to be enough anymore like what we were doing for m bar 1 to just consider one guns, right? So the standard one gun has only one gamma 0n structure. Again, if n is prime. Or I guess for any n, uh, mu n, right? So if we only consider things that have fibers being one guns, we're only going to add one additional point. So we can't get the right answer. So we have to go up to n guns, right? That's the natural thing to do. So Cn has two gamma zero n structures up to isomorphism. So it has mu n again, sitting inside the identity component, and it has the z mod n z. So that looks like what you'd want to use, right? But
But in fact, for technical reasons, you want your level structure to hit every irreducible component. So we'll see how that comes up in a minute. So what you actually want to use as the cusps are this guy and this one. So you don't want to allow this because the mu n doesn't hit each component. So this thing here is going to be the cusp infinity, and this guy here is going to be the cusp zero. So let me make a more formal definition. So M0 of n bar uh, attaches to S, the groupoid of uh, EGs, where E over S is a generalized elliptic curve. And G is a gamma 0 n structure, which in each geometric fiber hits each irreducible component. And that condition may look a little funny, but if you think about it, that means that the that's the equivalent to saying that the divisor defined by G is ample. Right? It means you have enough points to embed this curve. What is the genus of Y not N? Uh, we wrote some formula before. It goes to infinity as N goes to infinity. Yeah. Uh, All right, so that's the, that's the definition. Uh, and so, of course, this condition, you know, oh, and this is for any n, not just n prime. And so this condition is going to, of course, bound what kind of polygons can show up, right? You can only get things with n sides or fewer. And so the theorem, again, is that this is a proper dm set. So n0 n bar is a proper and smooth dm set. And so all, all this stuff, I mean, compactifying these moduli spaces of elliptic curves, or these generalized elliptic curves, uh, is due to Deline Rapoport. And so they have some very long paper that proves all these theorems that I'm stating. Okay, are there any questions? Oh, I, I didn't really get there yet, but we'll see soon. I mean, it, like I said, it makes the G ample, which lets you do some things that you, know, you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Any other questions? I mean, it's like some closed subscheme, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, like, think about a fiber, right? It's just like a bunch of points. Okay, so, well, here's one place where it's going to come up. So, I want to talk about maps between these different m zero n's. So suppose that uh, which way do I want it? N prime divides n. All right. So then the group gamma zero n is contained in gamma zero n prime. And so you get a map h star mod gamma zero n to h star mod gamma zero n prime. Of course, this is just x0 n mapping to x0 n prime. And we want to understand what does this look like in terms of the moduli theory picture. Okay, so on elliptic curves, it's very easy to see. So suppose that we have EG in M0 n bar with E an elliptic curve. So if G is a gamma 0 n structure, so it's a cyclic subgroup of order n. So there's a unique subgroup of order n prime, right?
And so the map just takes this EG to EH. weirder uh, on the generalized elliptic curves. So suppose now that EG is just an arbitrary on the generalized elliptic curve. So we again have an H. You need H inside G of the right order. But we can't just take EG to EH, right? Because there's this condition about meeting every fiber. And so the idea is just to contract the fibers that this thing doesn't hit. So I mean, if you think about one of these n-gons, some chain of P1s, and there's going to be a point of G in each one of them, H is some subgroup, so it'll maybe miss half of them or something. You just take the ones that aren't hit and just contract them away. And so the way that you can, and a nice way to actually do this contraction algebraically, uh, okay, let me say, so, so let, let's say E bar be the contraction. So E with components contracted that don't meet H. the map takes E G to E bar and the image of H. Yeah. All right, so let me tell you how to actually a nice algebraic construction of E bar. So uh, let's suppose that F is the structure map from E to S. So you can look at the relative divisor O E and N copies of H, right? And you can take the global sections of this and then you can sum over n. You get a graded ring on s. So if you did this with g, since g is an ample divisor, if you take prod, you just get the original thing back. right? So now we're just going to take prod of this, and that's going to contract away the parts that h doesn't hit, because you only get sort of constant functions on those components. That's the construction. Are there any questions? This isn't going to be terribly important for us, but I thought I should say it. So there's more details in doing wrap report. Okay. All right. So now I want to turn to uh, the topic of working over the integers. So far. Whenever we've considered level n structure, n has had to be invertible. And that makes life a lot easier because it makes the n torsion a tau. Right? But now we're going to work over z. It's not going to be a tau. It's going to be harder to work with. OK, so the basic problem is as follows. Well, I guess it's easy to say that elliptic curves in characteristic p can have no p torsion. Their p torsion can be too small if you think of the level of points. So, for example, if, if he's in a super singular elliptic curve. then the fp points of its end torsion are just zero. <laughs> this is what happens when I try to write while I'm talking. The basic problem. <laughs> okay, so if you have a super singular curve over fp, 
and we know that its key torsion <laughs> vanishes, right? There's no key torsion at the level of points. And so what would a gamma P structure on E be? So normally it's two points that give a basis of the P torsion. But it has no P torsion, so there's nothing that you can do. I mean, if you use the normal definition, it just doesn't work. And so, I mean, if you use the normal definition, you'd just be omitting the super singular points from the space, which is not good if you want something proper. And so there's a solution to this problem, which I think Drinfeld came up with. They're called Drinfeld double structures. They're a little more complicated. Um, but fortunately, we can get around those since we're only going to need x0p or x0n. OK, so you can do things like gamma p over z. Uh, but we're going to stick to something that's a little simpler. That's all we need. And I'm going to actually suppose that n is square free to do this. And I'll say why in a bit. OK, so uh, I'm going to define gamma 0 n structures again. So suppose that we have some generalized loop that curve. And now s can be just over z. So a gamma 0 n structure. Finite flat closed subgroup. It's a closed subgroup of E, which is finite and flat over S. And then we're going to define N0 and bar to be the set of these, sort of, I mean, it's going to be the category, the group weight of these EGs. Where again G meets each fiber. No, sorry, G meeting each irreducible component. And so the theorem is that this thing, M zero N bar, is a proper and flat DM stack over Z. So when N is inverted, this just reverts to the previous thing that we were talking about, and it's smooth over Z to N1 over N. But it's not smooth over the whole Z. And so we're going to talk about the special fiber and characteristic N in a moment, but I want to make some other remarks first. But question? Finite flat of order n. All right, so two remarks. So, first, I'll talk about, well, and this square free condition. So, you can do this with n square full. <laughs> but there's two things to be aware of. So first, this definition isn't quite right in general, right? Because gamma 0 n shouldn't just be any subgroup of order n. It's supposed to be a cyclic subgroup of order n. So you have to make sense of what that means. So you need to define what it, what it means for a group scheme to be cyclic of order n. Right? If n is p squared, should you allow alpha p times alpha p? Should you allow alpha p squared you have to decide those kinds of things? So that's one problem. And when n is square free, you know, everything can be regarded as cyclic. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, and then a more serious problem is that if p squared divides n, then you can write down 
a generalized elliptic curve uh, with gamma zero n structure that contains mu p in its automorphism group. And the fact about Delene Mumford stacks is that the automorphism groups are always a tau, which mu p is not. So this thing won't be a DM stack. But it is an Artin stack. So this actually works OK, I think, if you don't do generalized elliptic curves, if you're just doing the open moduli problem, then you get a Delene Mumford stack. Uh, but the compactified one causes problems. And actually, so I mean, Katz and Mazur worked out the theory of these Drinfeld level structures in a lot of detail in their book. And they didn't really do a moduli theoretic interpretation of the compactifications. They were just doing things like y, 0, n, but over all of z. Uh, and then Delene and Rappaport did the compactified theory, but they kind of didn't allow things at n. They were, for the most part, working over z, join 1 over n. And I think, like, working out, you know, what happens in general, compactified over z, wasn't actually done until, like, five or six years ago by Brian Conrad. Uh, I guess maybe because these kinds of difficulties come up. Okay, and the second remark is about the properness. So I want to say something about that. So the idea is the same that you're going to use the semi-stable reduction theorem to fill in. So suppose that we have K is the fraction field of A, and we have some elliptic curve E over K with some G, the gamma zero N structure. So we want to extend the DVR and then fill in the elliptic curve and fill in the structure. So we may as well just assume from the outset that E has semi-stable reduction can just go up and make that happen. And furthermore, we can assume that the underlying points of G are defined over K. So then what you can do is take the closure of G in the minimal regular model. So let, let me call E bar the minimal regular model. And then we met, I'll let G bar be the closure of G in E bar. And that actually lands in the smooth locus because we know that the smooth locus is the Neron model and that all the K points of E extend into the smooth locus of the Neron model. This is in the smooth locus. And since it's semi-stable, this the special fiber of the minimal regular model, well, it's, I mean, it could be an elliptic curve, but if not, since we're semi-stable, it's it's going to be one of these end guns. The Nairn model, I mean, you remove the singular points and you get a bunch of GMs. But in, in the minimal regular model, you get one of these end guns. Uh, I mean, I said that before when you we were talking about the special fiber of the Nairn model and the classification of them. So this looks like the kind of thing that we want. Uh, the problem is that this G bar, again, may not meet all the irreducible components. And so to solve that, you just do the same kind of contra contraction construction from before. So you just contract away the components here that don't meet G bar. And then you get something of the right thing, and that's how you extend. Maybe let E bar prime be contraction, contract components not meeting G bar. And this E bar prime and G bar is an M zero N bar over Okay, so that's roughly how the value of criterion goes. Are there any questions? Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, what this thing looks like in bad characteristic. So we have this n0 n bar. If we worked over z join 1 over n, then it was smooth. 
So when you reduce the mod any prime away from n, you just get some nice smooth thing. So now we're going to look at what happens at n, where it's not smooth. So suppose that p divides n. We're going to stick with n being square free. We're going to let n prime be n divided by p. We want to look at this n0 n bar over fp. So first, let's think about what gamma 0 p structures look like in characteristic p. So suppose that we have an elliptic curve where k is an algebraically closed field. characteristic p. So there's two possibilities for e, right? It can be super singular or ordinary. So if e is super singular, that means its p-torsion is what? No, p-torsion scheme. Hmm? No. No, alpha p has order p, this is order p squared. That's the right answer. <laughs> it's an extension of alpha p by alpha p. It's not alpha p squared, it's not alpha p times alpha p, and it's not the kernel of Frobenius on the second wit scheme. It's the other <laughs> extension of alpha p by alpha p. Okay, but the point is that it's a non-trivial extension. So it's only got one subgroup of order p. Of course, that subgroup's alpha p. OK, and then there's the ordinary case. All right, so then what is the p torsion? So in this case, there's actually a p-torsion point, right? And so over at p-bar, that means there's a z mod p inside of it. And then remember that this thing is self-dual under the they pairing. I mean, it's its own Cartier dual. So if you have a zp, you also have to have a mu p. So it's z mod p times z p. And so there's exactly two subgroups of order p. Right, so if you, if you had a group like z mod p times z mod p, there's a lot of subgroups of that order p, right? That's the lines in, in fp squared. But in this case, since these two group schemes are not isomorphic, you can't kind of do any kind of mixed thing. So you either get one or the other. That's why there's only two. So if you have some elliptic curve, there's actually you know, a canonical gamma zero p structure you can put on it, the kernel of Frobenius. And in the super singular case, that's the only one. In the ordinary case, you get one of the possible two. And uh, so that suggests that there's a map from m0 n prime to m0 n. We just add this canonical one. And so there is such a thing. And there's actually two maps. So there's another thing that you can do as well. So I'm going to define maps f and g from m0 n prime bar over fp to m0 n bar over fp. So it's going to work as follows. So suppose that we have some eg in here, where this guy here is a gamma 0 n prime structure. So then uh, f of eg 
Well, this is going to be the obvious one that we just talked about, the kernel of Frobenius. So take E, G, and then kernel of Frobenius. So, so remember, it, so E here is over some scheme S. S is just some FP scheme. And there's this relative Frobenius that goes from E to this twist guy. And then it's dual as the Verschebon, which goes from E, P, to E. And so one way to think about this E is that, well, at least away from the super singular locus, you're adding, I mean, you have these two choices of the torsion group, and you're always picking the one that's not a tau. You're picking the multiplicative one. And so at a generalized elliptic curve, uh, there's, there's kind of two gamma zero P structures, right? There's the one where you use mu P and the one where you use E my P. And here you're supposed to use the mu P one at the generalized elliptic curve. OK, and then you can also. The other thing that you can do is you can, so G of EG is going to take, the elliptic curve is going to be this P twist here. And then I'm just going to take the inverse image of the group G by Verschebon. Uh, so N is square free. So, I mean, N is equal to P times N prime. So this Verschebon is an order P map. So it's inducing an isomorphism on the N prime torsion. So you can just think you can think of this as just kind of moving the G back along that isomorphism to some n prime piece, and then adding in the kernel of Verschebung as the P piece. And the kernel of Verschebung is this uh, tau part. So in the ordinary places, this is adding in a Z mod P. So I'm also going to define two maps in the other direction. So we'll define f prime and g prime going from m0 n bar to m0 n prime bar. And so again, f prime is going to be the more obvious one. So it's going to take egh. So this is your generalized elliptic curve. This thing here is again a 0 n prime structure. And this thing is a gamma zero p structure. And what it does is just forget the gamma zero p structure. And then g prime, it's going to be the less obvious thing. You quotient by h and then take the image of g in that. So we want to know what the compositions are. So if I do f prime and then f, so I start with eg, and then I add the kernel of Frobenius to it, and then I forget the kernel of Frobenius. So that's the identity. And if I do g prime g, I start with eg, and then I take this twist and sort of I mean, the gamma zero p structure I add is the kernel of v, right? And then to go back down, I'm quotienting by that thing. So I'm taking e p mod the kernel of v. So this thing mod, its, mod the kernel of v. And v induces an isomorphism from e p mod its kernel back to e, right? And so g prime g is the identity as well. So if I do f prime g, that takes eg to this guy, and then just forgets about the kernel of v. And that turns out to be the Frobenius map on n0 n prime bar. And if I do g prime f, it's the same thing. So I do, I first go to eg f, and then I'm killing the kernel of f. And Frobenius induces an isomorphism from E mod the kernel of F to EP. So this is again Frobenius on M0 and prime. And 
And so, oh, maybe I shouldn't have erased those. Okay, so the idea is that every point here in the ordinary locus, it has two possibilities, right, for the, the structure that we put on, and f and g is kind of hitting, f hits one of them and g hits the other. And these are kind of isomorphisms, I mean, if you exclude the super singular locus, these are isomorphisms from this thing to, to each piece, because these f prime and g prime provide inverses. And so the picture is that this thing is two copies of this, but the super singular points are glued. Right? So, so I guess the result uh, is that n0 n bar is two copies of n0 n prime bar glued along the super singular loci in each one. And the gluing, I mean, so in each one, in each one of these two copies, you have the super singular set, and you're gluing along the Frobenius map because these compositions are Frobenius. And we'll come back to this, and I mean, we're going to talk about this. I think next time we'll do uh, the eichler shimura theorem, and this will be important, so we'll come back to it then. And this is also going to be important later on um, for something that we'll need to do. So it, it's very nice when n prime is 1. So you can do this at the level of core spaces also. So let's just do that. So in this case, m0 n prime is just p1. Right at level 1, just the space loop. The curves is the j line. And so m0 n. Uh, n here is equal to p, so it's prime. So if you look at m0 bar of p, the characteristic p, it's just two, two p1s glued at some finite set of points. Questions? Okay, that's actually all for today. It's a little early. <laughs>